So, in the last class we discussed uh, you know modified uh, screens like suppressor screen then synthetic screen right. So, I said with that we will not uh, go into other varieties these are most commonly used ones. Now, we will see what are some of the genetic techniques that could be useful, um, but primarily we are going to focus only on one because I thought that is uh, useful to learn which is say epistasis ok. So, epistasis basically helps us to find the sequence uh, of uh, you know a gene function if multiple genes are involved in a pathway right. So, what kind of pathways exist? The most calm well known one would be enzymatic uh, pathway in a biochemical you know series right biochemical pathways like glucose to glucose 6 phosphate and so on to pyruvate glycolysis almost all of you know I guess right. So, that is an enzymatic pathway right glucose 6 phosphate will come only if there is glucose fructose 1 6 phosphate is possible only if there is fructose 6 phosphate right and so on. So, you have enzyme 1, 2, 3, 4 like that they act there and then you also know um, successive structures formed in the development of an organ. So, in our example organ like for example, vulva development you have to have P and P's like only if you have them you can have the induced fates as well as the uninduced fates and only if you have those fates you can actually end up making the different uh, cell types that make up the vulva. So, you have a it is like you have a stone and then you sculpt a you know a idol out of it right um, or you carve something. So, you have a starting material and you have intermediate steps you build upon something over multiple steps. So, that is successive structures so, the, the point is you are making something in which there are multiple intermediate uh, steps and intermediate structures. So, these two are very similar the pro, you know substrate product along an enzymatic pathway or successive structures in making an organ. So, you make a limp uh, bud then it uh, protrudes some more then it spreads into making uh, you know different bones and then you have the web dissolving to make your uh, you know form. Um, so, that sort of a structure. So, these two are clubbed together here ok. So, we are going to see that way when we are going to do epistasis and the third one which is uh, second distinct one is a regulatory pathway where you know somebody gives you a message you take the message to someone else and someone else like someone is you know doing an action you want to stop and the message has to reach that person otherwise that person may be continuously operating you want to turn it off or sometimes you want to turn on like activation or suppression through a sequential signaling and they are called regulatory pathways. So, in regulatory pathways uh, li like for example, somebody is making something in an assembly line and you have too much of that uh, product in your inventory and you are not selling enough and you do not want to make any more. For that you need to go to the manufacturing facility and tell them do not make right. So, there you will have opposite outcomes either it is being made or not made. So, there are two outcomes and they are opposite. So, we will see uh, how we will be able to identify uh, genes that function in this these kind of pathways. So, there could be multiple genes involved in it like if you have intermediate steps for every step there may be a protein therefore, there may be an enzyme right um, sorry a gene. And mutations in any one of them loss of function in any one of them may have had the final outcome being the same, but you want to know which acts first which acts second and that is where epistasis helps. So, how is epistasis done it is extremely simple. So, what th this is a classical example um, this is not from Scott Gilbert this is from Campbell ok. Um, so, I used it in some other course and I took it from there and put in this. So, so, all of you know Beadle and Tatum discovered this one gene one polypeptide hypothesis right. Originally of course, it is one gene one enzyme as illustrated in this cartoon 
but uh, eventually we know that it is one end, uh, one gene, one polypeptide, right? So here they have mutations. Um, the way they are checking phenotype is uh, what is the precursor you need to give, or what is the product being made? Uh, for example, wild type grows as long as you have some uh, ammonia, you know, some nitrogen source, a precursor. Then from that, it can make the intermediates to make this amino acid arginine, right? But let us say you have three steps here, and enzyme A is mutated then that would grow only if you provide ornithine or citrulline or arginine precursor will not be enough and so on for the other two mutations. So, now let us look at uh, mutation 1 and 2 like enzyme A not being there or enzyme B not being there. Now, uh, if we look at uh, instead of looking at uh, what precursor you needed to give to grow it, let us look at what product it forms for this discussion uh, you know uh, in this context. So, enzyme A mutation will not make ornithine, okay, while enzyme B mutation will make ornithine. Now, if I make a double mutant A and B, what will be the phenotype with respect to whether it will make ornithine or not make? it will not make. So, the A B double mutant phenotype is the same as A mutation. In that context, this is an epistasis analysis and here you say A is epistatic over B. So, whichever gene whose mutant phenotype prevails in the double mutant, you call that as the epistatic. Okay. In this example, A is epistatic over B. So, A means no ornithine, A B is also no ornithine. So, B would have made ornithine. So, therefore, the A B phenotype is like the A phenotype. So, you say A is epistatic over B. Here in this situation, what you are finding is since it is already cartooned as he is saying, with the order is visible to you, A is first, B is second. So, in this kind of a situation, an upstream block is epistatic. Okay. So, Assuming this is not known purely based on this phenotype like A B phenotype is like A and knowing that it is a substrate product a sequential structure forming pathway, you are going to say upstream block is epistatic. Because let us say in an assembly line or uh, let us say the uh, you, have, you have an automobile manufacturing assembly line. Um, so, the initial step let us say somebody brings the body parts put together and then somebody uh, mounts the engine and then somebody fits the wheels. Now, if the body part assembly those workers have not come means then the rest of it cannot happen. Although the rest of the machinery and workers are all there, you are not going to make a car. Okay. So, the first part is essential and therefore, that is epistatic if it is not there. So, whether the body part assembling guys have come or not and uh, you know the wheel assembly guys have come or not, the end phenotype is no car is made, but when both are not there also the same and uh, if the first people are not there again it will be the same. So, the first block will be the uh, will be epistatic over everything else. So, when you see that relationship, then you know oh, enzyme A must be acting upstream of B. That is how this picture is drawn. Now, single mutation will only tell enzyme A is required to make arginine or it will say it is required to make ornithine. It will not tell you it is acting upstream of B. Yeah, so, then which, in, which intermediate product is getting converted to the other one? Let us, let us take ornithine and citrulline. How would you know that? So, that this is a simpler one if you take a longer one then you will find the complexity. Like if you go to warmbook.org and learn about uh, sex determination pathway there you will see a series of genes and there are opposite phenotypes and therefore, it is a very nice um, epistasis. So, you will find without epistasis you cannot figure that out.
you will see that in vulva making because we have an example in which we are going to learn all methods okay so this is one example and i told you right a and b are going to be together they are going to be similar so we saw an example for a now we are going to see example for b which is making vulva so we did not know whether genes control vulva development by doing mutagenesis and identifying mutants which follow mendelian inheritance we learnt genes control vulva development to start with right so now we found uh, how many genes did we find 20 or so right so how do you know which acts first which acts second so here is an epistasis like lin 26 vulvalis and when you do a detailed uh, nomoscopy observation you find there are no pnp cells made so all you are able to say is lin 26 is required to make pnp cells now you have let 23 mutant so there uh, all pnps became tertiary fate and you are saying it's required for induced fates both the induced fates that is what you are able to say now when you make double mutant pnps are not made so two things you are learning like assuming that also one did not do the cell lineage here you are learning pnps need to be made then only you can make the tertiary fate cells and second and more importantly for this uh, purpose of this discussion lin 26 acts upstream of lead 23 so li if lin 26 is not there the earlier block happens so through this you uh, what do you find in these two situations is an earlier block is epistatic so i i am again reiterating epistatic means when you make a double mutant uh, the phenotype of whichever gene single mutant one that is prevailing in the double mutant you call that single mutant phenotype as epistatic in this case the phenotype of lin 26 single mutant is no pnp cells and lin 26 led 23 double mutant is like that of the lin 26 and therefore you say lin 26 is epistatic and simply by saying lip, uh, lin 26 is epistatic you do not immediately come to the conclusion that it is acting upstream for that you need to know that this pathway belongs to the one of these two categories only in that situation upstream block is epistatic and you saw the logic here uh, as well as uh, here without these cells you are not going to make this and therefore this act this acts upstream but there is an opposite situation uh, that is what i often find people getting confused in the exam which is uh, regulatory pathways why is it mosaic because that organism is going to be mosaic because some tissues or some cells will have the wild type function of the gene while others are not having they have lost so this is an example of how you will do it okay like for example here you have a mutation the m over m okay it's a homozygous for that particular mutation now you have an extra copy usually these are uh, generated in large scale mutagenesis uh, using strong uh, mutagen like uh, gamma radiation etc so you make uh, bits and pieces of uh, chromosomes called duplicates and these uh, duplicates are characterized and they are known based on the phenotype they confer in this particular example what we are having is we have a duplicate in which the wild type copy of this uh, mutation m is present in addition we have wild type copy of another mutation this is being used as a marker mutation here so if it is homozygous for this uh, ncl the nucleolus will be bigger in those cells so now if this duplicate uh, if i lose okay then that particular cells nucleolus will be larger because it is not going to have wild type copy for this now i know there the duplicate is lost so that means my gene function also must be lost then i go and see what happened to that cell or what happens to the descendants of that cell and this is random because this is extra chromosomal it is not going to follow mendelian inheritance so since it is going to be random you do not know in which cell it is going to be lost and that is why you need this marker mutation 
So, this is one example where the NCL is being used, but there are varieties of uh, um, you know mechanisms to do this. Like for example, we learnt about uh, Cree locks earlier when we learnt about enhancers. So, that can be Cree activation also can be used temporarily or conditionally or tissue specific and so on. So, now you will get after mitosis some cells will maintain the um, duplication and as a result you will say on uh, that is a uh, wild type because it is non uh, NCL. So, therefore, you will assume that is like wild type and here uh, you do not have that and as a result the nucleolus is enlarged then you know that is uh, genotypically mutant and then you see what happens to that cell or the cells that descendant from that. So, the loss of duplication is what we are using here as a marker. So, this duplication is one way of doing mosaic ok, there are other ways like for example, Crelox is another way. So, now we will see in an example. So, mosaic animals contain both wild type and mutant so that they has become clear I guess. So, generated by spontaneous loss of free duplication by in this particular example duplication. So, recognized by including a cell marker. So, here that is the nucleolus um, size regulator. So, these are generated by x-ray mutagenesis or you can inject DNA uh, and that can be there in the nucleus as an extra chromosomal copy. Uh, YFG stands for your favorite gene and the marker ok. So, this could have come from in an organism like C. elegans where duplications are available for different regions it may be an already available duplication otherwise it may be this may be an injected DNA which has the two markers. So, YFG, YFP are commonly used uh, terms to say your favorite gene, your favorite protein. All right. So, here is an actual real life example of mosaic analysis ok. So, I so the, the reason we did not stop there is that does not uh, you know catch our attention like the way seeing it an example. So, here we are going to go and look at the vulva here ok. So, we learned those genes you know lin 15, let 20, uh, let 60, lin 23 all those genes right lin 15. So, now where are they required? ok. So, we have PNPs, we have tertiary fate, primary fate and these have descended from some cells uh, from embryo. So, at what step these genes are required and there you get help from mosaic analysis. So, here we are doing mosaic analysis for LIN15 ok. Um, so, LIN15 mutation or recessive mutations that cause all PNP cells to adopt an induced fate ok, multi vulva. So, that is background for us to start with. So, LIN15 if you do not have uh, homozygous uh, embryos that will develop into animals having multiple vulva. So, now let us look at um, by providing a duplication having um, a copy of uh, LIN15 wild type copy and a marker let us say NCL itself. Now, you follow from zygote and here you are seeing at what point you are the duplication is going to be lost and you are going to look at the phenotype ok. So, now you start with zygote and let us say nowhere it is lost in the entire embryonic lineage your duplication is not lost. You did not find a cell where the nucleolus was enlarged. So, that is going to end up developing into wild type ok, it will make one single functional vulva. Now, you find an embryo in which uh, P0 that is in zygote itself it was lost like all A, B, P1 both had enlarged nucleolus. It is like going to be LIN15 homozygous, so multi vulva. Now, you are going to look at an another embryo where zygote was normal, P1 nucleolus was normal, but A B had an issue and all the descendants will be from that A B right, it, it A B itself does not have the duplication, so none of the descendants will have it. Now, it is multi vulva indicating that its function is required in A B, either A B or one of its descendants it is required. Like that you go on A B P L, so here you know A B uh, P divides into left and right daughters like the granddaughter of that would be A B P L and A B P R 
and there if you lose it often times wild type meaning its presence in one or the other seems to be enough. Now, you go further you find in P 1 you are losing see look at the P and P's these are coming from A B P L and A B P R they are not coming from P 1, but when you lose in P 1 also you are having problems not surprising because we know anchor cell is important for vulva development and anchor cell comes from P 1. So, not surprising good it is required in both A B and P 1. Now, you go to another situation P 1 it is lost and you do not have anchor cell and you still have multi valve forming and then you go to another situation where there is no loss and no anchor cell and there again you have uh, there of course, you are not going to have vulva at all right because anchor cell is the one that is inducing and you do not get. So, you have these phenotypes now you look at uh, what you are finding uh, even without anchor cell right you are getting multi vulva indicating that this lin 15 seems to be expressed in cells other than the p lineage and anchor cell. So, this kind of a finding comes from this mosaic analysis. So, uh, these are the kind of my findings that will come only from mosaic analysis that is why that is taken here as an example. So, this was surprising for people and then they learnt. So, basically all these cells unless otherwise a negative signaling acts to suppress they will actually get into induced fate. So, that is cartooned here. So, there is underlying hypodermis from which there is a negative signaling that is actually making these things not to get induced at all and you are temporarily relieving that negative signaling by the signaling from anchor cell which is stronger on P 6 and as a result it becomes primary fate slightly weaker here therefore, they become secondary fate and therefore, these alone are induced and these are not induced because the negative signaling prevents it and the negative signaling when it is lost. So, here that being lin 15 now all of them are thinking I am going to become primary secondary and so on is this clear. So, all you are doing is simply you are just following the lineage and then you are seeing where the gene wild type copy is lost and what is the outcome. And knowing the this you are able to uh, determine at in which tissue at what time a gene function is required for a particular structure to form. So, this is the mosaic analysis. So, if it is not clear look at this at a less leisurely pace then you will get it clearly. But so, all you need is you need to very carefully follow this. So, this completes whatever we wanted to discuss. So, basically the Mendelian laws and then uh, the concept that recombination frequency informs us about the genetic distance and therefore, genetic mapping and how do you jump from that to physical map and identify an ORF and then what are the genetic tricks you can do in terms of learning more about gene function like epistasis and mosaic analysis right. So, now we will move away from this, but before we go. So, this is sort of summary these are the kind of experiments ok no biochemistry no molecular biology led to this understanding that is shown here like from here we went to this uh, through this and later of course, the molecules were identified this is um, you know this this signaling is the um, um, just forgetting the RAS map kinase pathway and this is the lateral signaling notch delta. So, the lin 12 doing this was uh, the first evidence of a lateral signaling like membrane bound ligand membrane bound receptor that idea comes from this. So, much later we will learn about a model for uh, lateral signaling when we are going to learn cell cell signaling also. Um, so, this is just a summary and these pathways like multiple pathways function to make this one little organ ok 
and they were all identified primarily through the techniques that we have so far learnt. So, you have EGF signaling or uh, notch signaling. So, notch signaling works in making sure these two remain as secondary fit and they do not become primary and uh, wind signaling as well as uh, this uh, another incident of wind signaling all of this comes from uh, these kind of approaches. So, next what we are going to do is a little bit more uh, you know uh, like update on how you do genetic mapping. The message is that you do not need always to have uh, known markers with known phenotypes ok that might limit uh, the ability to do mapping because you might have certain loci uh, where you will have problems with uh, the survival of that organism ok. So, let us say you have a marker locus and your locus if you make double mutant they are going to be dead and uh, other known markers are far away and you are unable to do a refine you are unable to refine your map. So, this those issues will happen because after all markers are here we are defining by their known phenotype and some phenot uh, some phenotypes may make them grow slow or largely embryonic lethal all those limitations will be there. But if you go to uh, um, the DNA sequence itself you are unlikely to have those issues because you are only looking at the wild type sequence, but then there are subtle sequence variations that can be exploited. So, primarily we are going to focus on uh, this SNP because this is what is most commonly used nowadays, uh, but uh, historically people used to use RFLP as well as VNTR you know variable number of tandem repeats like you may have in chromosomes a repeat sequence that repeats multiple times ok. In one strain you might have 10 repeats another one you might have 20 repeats. So, those variations in tandem repeats can be used as a marker. RFLP you probably know already that it is a restriction uh, fragment length you know like for example, in one strain you have a particular uh, restriction site sequence in a particular locus and in another one one base change and that restriction locus is not there. So, between the two strains you will have the fragment length will vary right. Let, let us say you have an equal or one side in one position and the next is 6 kb apart. In another um, strain you have from that particular equal or one locus that I took as an example at 3 kb you have another equal or one side. Now, the first one when you digest you get a 6 kb band the second one when you digest you might get 3 kb single band. So, there the restriction length is varying and therefore, there is a change in the morph like uh, you know the shape or whatever that you can detect here there is a change and that is coming from restriction fragment. So, that is why it is called restriction fragment length polymorphism. Let us look at single nucleotide polymorphism because right now it is practically very useful and very powerful it pretty much is limitless. So, what are SNPs does anyone know yes only one not, not necessarily alleles uh, by the genetic definition, but uh, strictly speaking they are alleles I agree with you, but you are not going to detect it by phenotype like you are taking two different strains and you are looking at the genome sequence. So, remember I am carefully using the word strain meaning you are talking the same species, but different uh, strains of it you are looking at the genome sequence and then you find in a given position there is a change in nucleotide ok. Like let us say uh, 134th nucleotide on chromosome 1 is A in another organism 134th uh, base on chromosome 1 from the left end is G. So, these two are SNPs. So, the variation is in one nucleotide. So, in an organism like C. elegans where the genome has been beaten to death meaning every base position we know confidently ok exact number of bases and the accuracy of each base is thoroughly known. In these kind of uh, situations um, by comparing wild strains uh, wild type strains that exist uh, you can find SNPs 
like here the commonly used one the one isolated by Sidney Brenner called the N2 that is from Bristol uh, England and another strain isolated in Hawaii okay they are far apart they never had genetic exchange at all over millions of years. So, these two strains are commonly used. So, you would have usually generated your mutation in the N2 strain. Now, you cross it with uh, Hawaiian strain. So, you will get a heterozygous right and now that will be F1. Now, you go to F2. L let us say the um, in F1 you have M over plus. So, M is N2 genetic background right and the plus is Hawaiian genetic background meaning the sequences the all SNPs that are possible they will all be there. Now, I go to F2. So, in F2 my mutant phenotype would have come one fourth right 25 percent of the F, uh, F2 I will be able to identify as homozygous for my mutant. Now, both the allele chromosomes there would have come from N2 background. So, suppose let us say I am going little away let us say I go to chromosome 2 let us assume mutation is on chromosome 1. Now, in F2 when I found one fourth of the population having mutant phenotype. Now, if I go to chromosome 2 what is the probability one of the allele is from N2 another allele is from um, Hawaiian strain right it will be independent. Now, let us come back to chromosome 1 let us take an SNP that is 10 bases to the right of my mutant base just 10 bases I am only looking 100 progeny. Remember in F2 I am not randomly picking worms I am picking the 25 percent that are carrying my mutation. Now, I am looking at an SNP meaning that 10th base from my mutant base differs between the N2 and Hawaiian strain. So, now in these worms which are homozygous for mutant which SNP will be there N2 SNP or Hawaiian SNP? N2 SNP it is going to show linkage that is the basis for a SNP based mapping ok. So, an example is here. So, here uh, PIF 5 is one of the um, mutants isolated in our lab and the student who was mapping it did an SNP mapping. So, what he did is so here this SNP is combined with sort of RFLP. So, the SNP creates a restriction fragment length variation say for example, I have um, two primers that flank a given base where SNP exists. Let us say I have um, this is 500 let us say 500 base pair product I will amplify using two primers and in between there at some point uh, I have a base where it, it varies between the N2 and Hawaiian. Now, let us say that variation affected a particular restriction site. Now, this PCR product after amplifying if I digest with the enzyme the one where that SNP does not affect the restriction site it will get cut into two pieces and the one where it affects will not be cut. So, that is what we are doing here. So, here this is uh, position 16 on a particular chromosome ok. So, the first lane is pure N2 strain ok I have not done any crosses. I took that and PCR amplified with these two primers for that particular SNP and I digested and there is no restriction site and it is not digested. Now, this one is Hawaiian strain it is not crossed with anything it is pure uh, pure breeding Hawaiian strain PCR and digested it has a restriction site at uh, closer to one end. So, it gets cut into two ok. Now, this is my mutant after crossing with the Hawaiian and F 2 in F 2 I have picked only the worms that show my mutant phenotype 
isolated DNA and I am digest uh, sorry PCR amplified and I am digesting. Now, I find it is not getting digested, it is looking N2. What it means is my mutation is closer to this SNP. How closer depends on how many worms I took here. Okay, if I took large enough that I accommodated a few worms in which recombination is possible, then I might get a mixture as you see for chromosome 2 here. So, sorry, position 2, same chromosome here. Uh, at marker position 2, this is N2 gets cut into 2. Okay, in this SNP, N2 gets cut, not the Hawaiian. So, this will vary depending on the marker. And in the my mutant when I took, I am seeing both versions. So, here you have uncut as well as you have cut, meaning this seem to be a mixture of Hawaiian as well as N2, indicating that my mutant is mutation is quite away from position 2. If you look at this, you might say it is closer to 16. Now, you look at the result of 18 and 21, then you realize it is probably to the you know left uh, to the right sorry the right is where we say plus far to the right of uh, position 2 probably in the vicinity of uh, 16 to 21 somewhere there. So, this one uh, for the entire region of the chromosome you could of course, sequence uh, bits and pieces and you can use any SNP, but this is practically lot easier to do. So, for the entire length of all chromosomes, they have very specific defined primer pairs and they already know uh, what is the enzyme you need to digest, what is the expected products for N2 and Hawaiian strain, it is known, it is known for the entire length. So, the C. elegans chromosomes are highly rich with these markers. So, um, the power of mapping using SNP is literally limitless. So, many students nowadays what they do is uh, right after chromosome assignment, theoretically speaking chromosome assignment also can be done this way. Okay, you assign chromosome and then right after that you are worried about how to do that. So, you will see which SNP shows close um, link with yours initially. So, then picking multiple uh, SNPs in one go like you get F2 DNA and then if it is a marker mutation you will only have one marker to see. Here you can piece your amplify any pair of primers right. So, that means multiple SNP I can see in one go. So, in a matter of 3 to 4 days I will know a very very short interval where it is. Then what we do currently is uh, which is not there in the slide, but I am just telling it will only take um, you know 30 seconds to say that in, in addition to the slide. Um, once you come to such a short interval, all you do is you do the whole genome sequencing uh, which is easy because you are not doing it. You isolate the DNA and send it to a facility and they send you the sequence and you tell them I do not care about the whole genome sequence in this genetic interval on in this chromosome tell me all the mutations that affect an amino acid sequence of uh, any protein. So, they are going to omit all those mutations that are not affecting protein coding sequence and even in protein coding they are going to ignore all the synonymous mutations and they will only identify the ones which um, miss sense or premature stop or a deletion etcetera. They will give you an excel sheet. Then you look at the excel sheet then right away know oh yeah this gene fits with uh, my phenotype and then you will immediately know what it is and then you revalidate by Sanger sequencing of that region to see whether you have a mutation there. So, that is how you can very quickly map ok, but otherwise the basic principle is the same as what we learnt initially with the recombination frequency. The rule followed is the same as uh, what we used between black and vestigial and then that is CN right, because you are again doing the cross and then you are uh, seeing which marker shows uh, linkage with your phenotype. So, there it was a phenotype that co-segregates like is um, you know see how often CN is seen with black or not, here it is which SNP is seen with the mutation or not only the detection varies here. 